Good afternoon and welcome to this panel discussion on will AI and data transform healthcare post the crisis. So we've got uh, a strong panel of speakers here to discuss that topic. Uh, we will take some questions from the audience uh, if we have time. We've only got 45 minutes for the discussion, but you can input questions during the uh, session. Now, uh, I'm David Pringle. I'm a senior advisor with Science Business. Thank you to the audience for joining us today. Uh, with me on the panel, I have Jan Philip Beck. He's Chief Executive Officer at EIT Health. And we have Matteo Valero Cortez. He's Director of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Casper uh, Klein, he's Vice President of Government Affairs at Microsoft. So uh, a strong panel with uh, a diverse uh, perspective. So looking forward to talking to them. Uh, I just want to flag before we get going, Science Business has uh, just published a new report on um, data regulations in Europe and whether they are helping or hindering open science. It's very relevant to this discussion and very relevant to this conference as a whole. You can find that report uh, on our website. It's actually the last publication by our cloud group, which has now been subsumed into our new data rules group, which is going to look at uh, the issues around data policy and AI policy more broadly and uh, globally indeed, look specifically at how best to harness uh, data and AI, which is exactly the topic of today's discussion, of course. Now, in the uh, context of the pandemic, I think um, data and AI has had some impact, but I think overall it's been somewhat underwhelming in terms of helping us deal with uh, COVID-19. But um, it has, as we've been hearing in the event today, created quite a momentum and quite a uh, appetite, let's say, for change. So I'm going to start there with the panel. I'm going to start with Jan Philip, actually, and just say, really, how quickly do we think the healthcare sector can move forward now in terms of embracing, let's say, big data analytics and AI and really improving health outcomes? So Jan Philip, what's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, thank you very much, David. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Well, I think it's probably... Uh, Kasper will also know that, I mean, the healthcare sector traditionally is not the one that is maybe uh, fastest in terms of, of uptake when it comes to, 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 to IT enabled um, um, solutions. But I think here now uh, we have a unique uh, opportunity um, to bring, to, to have a common sense of urgency amongst politicians, policymakers, but also healthcare providers, um, the industry, and maybe even most important uh, patients and citizens, right? So I think um, the old roadblocks are very much the new ones, but maybe we have, as I said, a different sense of urgency and potentially we can find also different angles um, uh, to approach them. So I think we can certainly accelerate the uptake now for digital solutions for the always same and the still right reasons, right? Improving patient experience and outcomes, driving efficiencies, reducing money that's wasted. I think there are three things maybe that we can tackle and should tackle at European level. And I got a bonus one that I think primarily needs to be tackled um, at member state level. So I think as it has been actually echoed in, in previous discussions already today, I believe that we need to use this momentum now to move towards a kind of GDPR, maybe 2.0, where mainly I think fragmentation and regulative insecurities, if you wish, um, are reduced between member states. So I think the question around use, reuse um, of health-related data, I think it just needs to be regulated and interpreted in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same way uh, within member states um, to create a level playing field. And I think that can unleash um, um, innovation. Uh, secondly, I think we've, um, we need to talk about interoperability, data quality, um, but also then the investment um, of infrastructure. Maybe eu for health uh, the new emerging program can help. But I believe also here, um, maybe in this space, um, this space, a lot of public procurement is done. Maybe more can be done here to make sure that that these key principles are enshrined um, in uh, when when procuring new AI also enabled systems. And then number three, I think, is not investing in knowledge and skills. I think that digital skills is what we need the most, and in some institutions still have least. So I think it's very, very important to tackle that, um, to make sure that that also decision makers have the capability um, to move things uh, to move things forward. So the combination of these three pieces, GDPR 2.0, if you like, 
um, interoperability and infrastructure investment, as well as knowledge and skills, might then also be a key enabler for what we often talk about as a European health data space. And then I think the bonus piece for the member states, and then I stop, I think would be to really look at how we can find um, creative or innovative ways to, 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 to open pathways for reimbursement uh, for digital solutions. So to accelerate their assessment, but also to see if we can, similar to what Germany has done now with the Digital Care Act, um, maybe these are, these are pieces that we can uh, accelerate to, to, to foster adoption. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jan. Let's come to Matteo. Uh, just building on that, are you, uh, Jan Philip sound, I think, relatively optimistic there that health tech is going to change healthcare now. How do you think about that? Uh, I am always optimistic, by the way. So, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I mean, uh, I would like uh, to start uh, giving thanks to the work from the Commissioner Gabriel to our field, uh, high performance computing and artificial intelligence. I remember when a few months ago, Thomas Escordas was contacting us and then Chineca Supercomputing Center as an instrument to deal with the coronavirus things, okay? So uh, we were uh, playing a very good role and I think the technology we have are crucial for the future. Now we have the Escalade for EU and many other things. By the way, the commissioner was the main responsible a uh, few years ago, three years ago, together with Roberto Viola, Director General of the Euro SPC Initiative. And I think that now we need to do the same values of the we have in the USPC just for HPC, AI, and health, acting together and acting fast. I think that could be my main political message, but I am not political, I am a scientific, even I am an expert in computer architecture, I am not coronavirus expert, but I would like to transmit to you what I learned from the during this time from the research at BSC at Barcelona and more in special from the health of the life science department, Professor Alfonso Valencia. So let me tell you, let me start telling you that we at the supercomputing center, we have very fast computer with a huge memory and we run simulations, simulation of the, of the real world. We are dealing with very, very complex problems at the one we are dealing in this, in this uh, meeting, okay? We have a lot of experience dealing with data just let me tell you how big the data are for the study of the climate change. When the data should be private, we do that. We follow the rules, obviously, the privacy. So we, in our supercomputing center, we are dealing with a huge quantity of information coming from the genomes, okay? And the researchers do very good research based in, uh, in this data, okay? So what we learned from the COVID is that the COVID produced a huge quantity of data, mainly at the hospital. But also what we uh, learn is that this data for the moment are not available for the researchers. And one of the, our first message is that this data should be made available to the researchers as all the data that we use for the climate change are all the data we use, for example, for the cancer, uh, for the cancer research, okay? This is, uh, uh, an urgent question, okay? How we made available this huge uh, uh, data to the researchers. The second thing is that the future medicine will be very complex. It's still very complex. So we need to provide with the best uh, advice, with the best decision support to the doctor. And obviously the IT technology, many other technology are crucial to provide with this information to the doctor in order then to have the final decision. But what we need is not just data. We need, I think, at, at least within at the supercomputing center that we need to reproduce what we did in another disciplines, okay? We need to convert, to use this data in order to understand uh, better uh, how the body works. We need to transform this data and computational model, okay? Uh, in order, for example, to discover the, 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 uh, the best drugs. So summarizing, in our opinion, at the BSC, we think that the challenge for the future can be pictured in, in four main steps. First, general access to medical data. This is crucial. We need to go in this direction. I know that in my country, Spain, we had recollecting plenty of data from the hospital. I know in another European countries, we are doing, you are doing the same. I think that should be done at the European level. We need to provide with our researchers with as much data as, as they need from any place the, the, the data are produced, especially at that time from the, from the medical uh, records. 
we need to integrate the medical, genomics, and socio socioeconomical data. This is very important. We need to develop of effective medical decision support system. And four, we don't know. We don't need to forget the development of the scientific necessary to understand disease and to be able to simulate them at the appropriate resolution level. We are very expert on that. We need to transform biomedical data and knowledge into computational models in future medical digital twins as personalized models of human disease. And this is the dream that we have to transform into a reality for the better future of society. Let me tell you that there are plenty of experience on the supercomputing center working with bioinformatics week, working with the doctor in this direction, and I am very, very optimistic. Oh, okay, thanks, Mateo. We'll come back to some of that, but that's uh, that's quite a to-do list uh, of uh, maybe some technical challenges there, actually. So, Casper, I mean, just building on what Mateo is saying, there's, I mean, this is a very complex industry which requires a a, a lot of support from computer science. So. What, what do you see as the major obstacles going forward? I'm not a computer scientist myself, so I have the benefit of speaking, uh, you know, partly in ignorance on this issue. <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks very much, David, and, and thanks to everybody else for participating in the debate. Um, you know, very happy to, to join in and uh, perhaps share some of the experiences we've had in Microsoft in trying to respond to, uh, to COVID-19 and, and the global pandemic. But I actually wanted to begin by, by going back to, to a couple of the points that Jean-Philippe said uh, in the beginning, because I think he's spot on in saying <clears throat> that, you know, you cannot say a lot of good things about the global pandemic. You cannot say a lot of, a lot of good things about how we've been struggling in Europe in, in responding to you know, a devastating situation, at least in, in countries like, like Spain and Italy. Um, I think the only positive thing you can actually say is that, you know, if, if nothing else, then digitalization has been accelerated dramatically. We probably had, you know, a couple of years of digitalization taking place in literally just a few months. Uh, we probably lost a couple of years of, of economic growth uh, on, on the flip side of the coin. So, so I think those two things are, are perhaps, uh, you know, um, not necessarily part of a positive development, but, but the digitalization I think has been crisp, made crystal clear to, to everybody. What, what I would say is that it's also evident uh, for all of us, I think, that data is part of the solution to COVID-19 if we just face the immediate uh, response. Uh, we've been trying to, to do a couple of things uh, that I wanted to mention, David, as, as an example of how we have been trying to make our technologies and our platforms available in, in trying to help uh, governments and decision makers, healthcare workers uh, deal with uh, an unprecedented challenge. And, and some of it might be small, tedious issues, but I think all of it combined points in one direction, um, and, and this is where I share some of some of the previous speakers' comments. I, I remain fundamentally op optimistic about the fact that data-driven healthcare, the use of machine learning and AI is going to be a game changer in, in providing better healthcare, uh, also more efficient healthcare uh, to people around the world, especially if we harness sort of the, uh, the and mitigate some of the challenges that we're facing. But what we tried to do uh, early on in, in, in this global pandemic crisis was to to go in in three different areas. Uh, one of them was to create bots, simple bots that would alleviate some of the workloads uh, that healthcare workers were faced with. So basic initial screening of potential uh, patients, making sure that we generated data on, on uh, you know, what, what, the, what the virus would look like, what efficient responses uh, would look like. Um, I think, again, especially in those countries that were hard hit by the virus, uh, that made sure that healthcare workers could concentrate on more severe cases rather than less severe cases. So a good example of what we would be able to do there. The, the other aspect is, you know, similarly to what we're doing right now, uh, remote working, you know, using our technologies to make sure that patients could meet their doctors online, that, you know, basic uh, prescriptions of medicine could take place uh, online, and making sure that researchers and scientists would be able to continue their work working at a distance. And, you know, if I explain this to my mother or my brother, they're not necessarily super impressed. They say, you know, that's just a simple video conference system. Um, it's not necessarily AI in, in the way we normally think about it. But I wouldn't underestimate the impact and the, and the importance of us having 21st century technology available today in responding to the crisis. Could you imagine how the world would look if we did not have access to these kind of tools? We would have a much more severe economic crisis. More people probably have lost their jobs. And I think in responding to, to the healthcare crisis, it would have looked uh, a lot more difficult. And then the last thing I just want to say before uh, you know, handing over the floor back to you, David, is 
um, and this is perhaps where, where it becomes more AI uh, focused. We've been giving uh, credits on our cloud system, Azure, uh, to enable um, scientists to, to basically use machine learning systems to do scanning of, of lungs to try and, and basically, um, you know, flag out exactly what the virus would look like, what kind of damages you would, you would see uh, on individual patients. And of course, both to give the individual patient uh, a better treatment, but certainly also to accumulate more knowledge about the, the crisis, uh, about the virus, how it evolves and, and how we best respond to it. So I think in all those areas, those are small examples of the revolutionary power of, uh, of data-driven healthcare and why we fundamentally believe this is important. The only thing I would say, and then I promise to shut up is, I think what we have to add as perhaps a fourth point, which is enormously important to me as an individual, but also to, to Microsoft as a company is to make sure we roll out these systems focusing on privacy, focusing on fundamental rights. Uh, because I think one of you mentioned before that we have very different approaches to, to healthcare around Europe, have 27, 27 different models, and that we haven't been very good at sharing data uh, in, in, from a historic point of view. But for good reasons, because these are super sensitive data. I certainly did, do not want my personal health data to flow around Europe without any security, any scrutiny. So I think we have to make sure that we have a lot of focus on, on, on basic rights, we have a lot of focus on privacy, and that we set in, in motion uh, appropriate mechanisms to, to ring fence uh, the data that we're going to develop in healthcare. Okay, uh, great. Thanks, Casper. That's a uh, good scene setting from all three of you there, actually. So, uh, Jan Philip, I mean, let's building on Casper's uh, final point there. We, although we're seeing a, a lot of potential around digitization, we are dealing here with a fundamentally quite a conservative and cautious sector of the economy. And, and rightly so. I mean, healthcare is not necessarily going to be at the cutting edge of the adoption of AI and other advanced ICT technologies. So looking at the healthcare sector, how could we and should we be trying to change that culture around, that cautious culture around digital tech? Mm. Yeah, that's, um, uh, that's a very good question. I think that there's... Um, so I think as a as a as a um, uh, so I think that that health professionals, if we start there, that they are acting also in a cautious way and risk averse. I think is 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 a good thing. It's in in, in many regards uh, um, um, it's it's appropriate. So I think one thing that we need to do from a first from a from a regulator's side and maybe also the various bodies that are helping to interpret legislation and give guidance on that is that we try to to create a, a playing field that has more security and that that helps healthcare providers to navigate this 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 field of um of of governance security while supporting interoperability and all these pieces so i think we we cannot leave it up to every single um um healthcare provider um, potentially every single doctor to try to uh, to navigate this. So, so I think this is this is really um, this is really important. And I also believe, and maybe probably Casper can comment on that as well. I think that industry also plays a role um, to 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 then put to offer systems and and and, and infrastructures, uh, basically frameworks upon which um, digital innovation or digital solutions can be developed and flourish. That that adhere. Um, to key to key principles and that are transparent and reliable and so on, so that we can develop patient trust. Now, I think focusing a bit inwards, I mean, into healthcare providers, I would think again, and I'm repeating myself a little bit. I think we need to rethink um, education and invest in skills, but also develop then capabilities, so that I think healthcare providers also, let's say, gain. Sovereignty, maybe in choosing in AI and, and um, enabled or data-driven systems, and really making making use of that technology and, and having the capability to to take the right decisions. And I think, secondly, we also need to, yeah, imp challenge healthcare providers to to look beyond their own legacy systems to improve connectivity there, with a strong strong focus on really. Um, improving also patient experience yeah and enabling let's say some digital pathways so trying to put patient experience first and again um i think that a lot of um despite you know all the suffering and hardship in this crisis i think patients also now for example chronic patients have experienced um 
how how hurtful the, the loss maybe of connectivity um, to the healthcare systems can be. And now um, I think if we if we if we seek the opportunity to say, well, we have we can develop solutions to to not let that um, pathway break. I think there is an op there is an opportunity because I think patients are ready uh, to embark on that journey. And so let's um, let's put patient experience and need first, and 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 use that as the guiding principle to 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 also develop. Um, they develop the way um, healthcare providers interact with their with, with citizens and patients. Um, yeah, I think those would be my my key things. Could, yeah, sorry, if I just stay with you briefly. Actually, it's just an, on the question of money and the flow of money, and you know how healthcare providers are reimbursed, um, and and whether essentially there are financial incentives for experimenting with new technologies, etc., and, and trying new uh, techniques. It, I mean, how much of that needs to change? Well, I think again, also falling back maybe on on, on some bigger and well-established debates. I think um, we should really, in principle, in general, um, move towards um, um, to defining a, a good, clear concept of, of of value, patient value, and 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 pay based on that. Right. I think this is really important to move into focus, and I think it will accelerate. Um, it will also accelerate the uptake of digital. Um, uh, it will ac accelerate the uptake of digital um, technologies because I think they can really support that. Now, when it comes to uh, supporting the uptake of innovation and maybe potentially also, let's say, not only the big, huge systems, but also uh, maybe pieces that also smaller companies might be bringing forward, which can I think be an, an important piece in a, in a, let's say, health service universe. I think here we can also look at more, maybe some new and innovative approaches to, to reimbursement. So for example, um, I said it very briefly earlier, I think the German government has put a digital care act in place, which basically says, well, um, we first look and, uh, at the safety, of course, at, your, um, at the solution that you offer. And once that is given, uh, we, we give you reimbursement for a certain period of time to then enable you to actually generate the necessary data to prove that it really is, um, is effective and so on and so forth, that it generates the right outcomes. And once that is given, we take it up into, into our catalog for more long-term reimbursement. And I think that is an interesting idea because it kind of cuts through the problem that sometimes, especially smaller, um, also smaller companies of which we have many in our network, um, they might have the problem that they have an interesting solution, um, but they but it's hard for them to generate sufficient data uh, to prove its um, its um, efficacy. So, I think we should we should look at different um, at different um, approaches here, paying for value um, rather than fee for service, as well as also maybe more innovative models. And and on both in EIT Health, we have done work uh, also with our industry um, healthcare providers. We have looked at. At, at value-based healthcare models in their deployment in Europe. And we've also, of course, are feeling the pulse of the startup community. Okay, all right, no, thanks, Jan Philip, that's very helpful. Matteo, I wanna to turn to the, the tech industry with you and talk a little bit about what the tech industry needs to do, particularly around building trust um, in the healthcare community around what technology can do and how it can support their work. So okay. how does the tech industry need to change? Yeah, so, uh, yes, thank you. So. If you allow me, let me come back a little to what I said before, just simple ideas. So unfortunately, you know, we produce plenty of data, unfortunately, at the hospital. The data per se has no value, okay? If we just put the data in the hospital, we will not take advantage of having this precious uh, information, okay? So uh, as I said, we need to pass this information. We need to allow the access to this information to the resources because they will use this data in order to produce a computational model. That this is the only way or the best way to understand better how the body works. And then that will allow us to be ready for the next, we would like not to have a repetition, we, we will be able to understand better the body, the, the body, the human body, and then to be prepared for any, any disaster in the future. So this is very important. In order to do that, we need to work together to act very fast, 
but together. So at the European level, we need to see how we uh, uh, take this data, how we uh, 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 use the artificial intelligence at the supercomputing center. I think they are very important, crucial, the use of this very good technology, and then to see how the uh, researchers work and together develop models that we don't have now, but that there are, that, uh, but that there are very, very important for the future. The, the idea of the, of the digital twins, we have the opportunity, opportunity now to go in this direction. So obviously the artificial intelligence supercomputer are together, the data, the good data, the research, we should promote that. We have a unique opportunity in Europe. Okay, uh, thank you, Matteo. Um, Casper, this is uh, potentially a good question for you. It's just coming from the audience and it's relevant to what we're talking about actually, is around how do we deal with potential algorithm bias in a healthcare context? And this, I, I, this is really about the question of how much healthcare can trust AI and, and its provenance, I guess. So uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you think about taking bias out of algorithms? Well, I think we think a lot about that, and and it's probably one of the areas that we are we're investing uh, more and more resources in to make sure that the system that we're helping to build will be uh, without flaws, will 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 work for humanity at a at a greater stage. I, I think there are two two approaches to this, if you allow me, David. I mean, one is of course what technology companies like Microsoft will do on its own, and I think you know the commitment to making sure that we are laser focused on building systems that is completely inclusive, that you know works for everybody, regardless of, of background, regardless of, of the geographic location is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, it's one of the few areas where, where the more data you have, of course, in general, the better the systems are. Um, so I think on healthcare, there are some limitations because of course, access to data uh, is a problem or will remain a, remain a problem for good reasons. I mean, I'm not saying that we should change this, but in general, we are advocating, you know, open data. We have an open data campaign which is basically saying, you know, open data should be the default. And then there are a couple of areas where we should avoid, uh, you know, progressing with, with an open data um, aspect. Anyway, I think companies have a, have a societal responsibility is one of the reasons why we have now, um, you know, a, a, a part of Microsoft dedicated to, to responsible AI to make sure that in all the products we, uh, we develop and we build and we put out that responsibility is an essential part of that. What I would say, though, is that in this might come as a shocking surprise. Um, we are also among the companies that are advocating for more regulation in this area. I think we can do a lot by ourselves, but we also want to make sure that at the end of the day, policy reigns supreme, that it is up to, to governments or to international organizations, in this case, the European Union, to make sure that they set the guardrails for how uh, our technologies are being, uh, being rolled out. And what I would say, and you know, I used to work on, on the government side uh, before joining Microsoft, I, I think sort of the gap between where technology is and where policies or you know, the regulation is today, that gap has perhaps increased a little bit because of the fast pace of digital uh, technologies. So what is the deduction of that? Well, in my view, the only way to do this in, in the best possible way is to have a multi-stakeholder approach where you bring together the industry together with, uh, with governments, with uh, with regulators to make sure that we get this right. So I think it's a shared responsibility. And um, just before handing over to Matteo, who I, who I think wants to, to comment on this, um, I, I just want to point out one thing that uh, Jan Philippe said at the, the beginning, which I think is incredibly important. And that is, you know, COVID-19 has also made it crystal clear that without digital skills, it is going to be very difficult to survive in a digital economy. Um, and I think that applies for all of us. But of course, we've also seen that those, uh, unfortunately, many millions of people who've lost their jobs during uh, COVID-19, many of them are now in desperate uh, need for, for being reskilled. And I think digital skills and competences is going to be incredibly important. Um, so in fact, later today, we're going to make a, a fairly big announcement of, um, of, of you know, making our resources available in Microsoft, but also on LinkedIn. To, to basically reskill 25 million uh, people globally to make sure that we try and contribute to the skilling effect that uh, Jan Philippe mentioned at the beginning. I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges uh, moving ahead. So so stay tuned for for that uh, announcement later today. A little okay. bit of advertisement, sorry about that, but I had to uh, use the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you for the sneak preview. Now, Matteo, do you want to come in on sure. artificial intelligence? No, I would like to make a comment about Casper uh, say. I appreciate the, the work that uh, Microsoft can collaborate. I think that Europe is able, we collaborate with everybody. 
but collaboration doesn't mean dependency. Okay, we, we need to be a little independent having our technology. And let me tell you that I am not happy when I see that the app for tracing depend totally from Google and Apple. I think this is very bad for Europe and many other things, okay? So you can put ethical things when you control the technology. And this is a very important uh, opportunity for Europe to try to develop things as we did with the Airbus or with the Galileo. Let me tell you that the, for the main components we are talking about, just at the hardware level, we are totally dependent from outside, okay? And uh, thanks to uh, the commissioner and Roberto Viola, we are start the Euro SPC, which is a very good idea. We are pushing that because we need to develop our microprocessor in order to avoid the uh, side doors, many other things. We can do with our ethical behavior things that in Europe we cannot do because we don't control the technology, okay? The same happened with the artificial intelligence. We are promoting, we are developing many good uh, algorithms many good companies, but many of them are going outside Europe. We need to protect them, okay? And with the data, we need to do the, the same. I mean, I, I am not saying that Microsoft that doesn't control, doesn't give uh, ethics in the data, but we need to control. You know that there are companies that are, are buying the data, and this is not bad compared with the companies who are getting your data without any control, and they are selling your data. We need to be very careful with the data, okay? So um, be careful. Okay, uh, thanks, Matteo. Let's let's get both Jan, Philip, and Casper to, to comment on that. Actually, because I mean, what we're essentially talking around there is the concept of technological and, and data sovereignty, and essentially who's who's in control, really. So, uh, Jan, Philip, I mean, from your perspective, how important is that? I mean, just very briefly, maybe I can I can approach it from the from the perspective of a number of the companies we are we are supporting smaller ones but also from stakeholders from industry with whom we have been working on this and and i do think that um that there is a great interest in um especially also in healthcare but also in other industries for example in manufacturing and so on to develop critical capabilities um, here and also drive innovation forward here and i think that of course there are elements around investments and all of these pieces but i think there is it's and i said it at the beginning i think we need to come to terms with a with a with a strong regulatory um, environment and i think gdpr has been a first step but i think we need to erase the fragmentation and its interpretation and reduce insecurities as i said before but then i think also when it comes to for example um assessing and um eventually then approving um innovation i think europe also needs to be a leader in good quality regulation. And I think speed is also of the essence. I mean, if we look at EMA, for example, I think the, as far as I understand, the, 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 the now the evolving new regulatory strategy, the process that's in place, I think that's very good. And I think there's a lot of um, interaction with the community, which is really good, but speed is very important. So, so, so I think we, we have to understand that in that space of um, data-driven innovation, high quality regulation, which for me also means um, uh, reducing ambiguity and insecurity is a decisive factor for competitiveness. Okay, thanks Jan Philip. Casper, uh, yeah, if you can comment on this, this notion of technological sovereignty, data sovereignty, I mean, it's, it's on the agenda of the new European Commission. So from Microsoft's perspective, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, and I also want to want to you know address that head on because uh, I think you you can call it digital sovereignty. I think it, it also has a little bit to do with the tech lash that we experienced in in Europe. You know, one of my favorite expressions is "never let a good crisis go to waste." And as I said earlier on, I think COVID nineteen is a a crisis that we can use to to make a positive difference in terms of digitalizing our societies and taking advantage of pe people like Matteo who has access to to the latest technology. Now, digital sovereignty, um, you know, I, I've been spending uh, quite a bit of time uh, looking into this topic for, for obvious reasons. And I think one of the challenges, of course, that there are perhaps 27 different interpretations of what digital sovereignty means. But I think the fact that Europe wants to make sure that data is located in Europe, that data is processed in Europe, that the telemetry remains in Europe, I think that's something uh, that is, is uh, fully understandable also for a company like Microsoft. What I'm trying to say is that I think, you know, this is a trend or trajectory that is here to stay. I think most regions, most countries would not accept that data would would uh, would leave uh, areas. 
And I think this is a good example of how the industry will have to adopt to, uh, in this case, to Europe and uh, not the other way around. So I think what you will see from, from us and from Microsoft is we want to be a partner to Europe as it develops it, its own digital sovereignty. Um, I think there are different interpretations of, different, uh, of digital sovereignty that we like better than others. But in terms of having regulatory sovereignty, the ability to define the rules uh, that technology companies will have to adapt to, we're all for that. I think our only uh, request would be that this is not a closed party, that everybody's uh, invited to it, as long as you adhere to, to the rules or the values, uh, the regulatory framework that is being uh, rolled forward. So bottom line, I think we fully understand uh, where digital sovereignty discussions are coming from. We think they're legitimate. Uh, to some extent they're necessary. I'm speaking as a European here as well. We just want to make sure that we contribute uh, in, a, in, a, in a proactive way to, uh, to bringing uh, Europe forward in, in this area. Okay, um, thank you, Kasper. Matteo, if you just do a quick comment on that, because we're running short on yes, time. Yes, yes, I agree with Kasper. Uh, sovereignty doesn't mean anything. You need to apply sovereignty to, uh, to a topic. For example, it's clear for me that sovereignty in the design of a processor means that Europe is able to uh, uh, design processor, and this is not what happened now. So we are totally dependent on our side. So anything the data we produce now in the hospital means that the data will be used just for European, controlled by European. Is that true? Can you guarantee, can we guarantee that all the data that has been produced in the European hospital has been on, on, on only accessible for the hospital? This means sovereignty for me at the data level, at the processor level, and I can tell you another topics, but I, I appreciate really, and I have very experience, a lot of experience working with Microsoft. I think you are doing real work, uh, collaborating with Europe. I don't have any doubt. Okay. Okay. No, thank you. I want to. We've only got five minutes left. So, uh, Jan Philip, I want you just quickly to comment, if you may, on the common data spaces, and particularly, obviously, the health common data space and the Commission's proposals for that. Uh, it's come up a couple of times today during the conference. First of all, how important is it that we have that common data space? And secondly, how much can of that can happen um, prior to having legislation? Or is it dependent on the, the, leg the regulatory process, let's say? So I think it's, um, I think it's a good proposal um, or a, a good ambition. I think it's also, it's, it, it is, it's, it's very important to go into that direction. Um, I think that can it happen without other legislation? Well, maybe, but I think it would fall behind its potential. Let's put it right. this way. I don't again want to risk here um, repeating myself, but I think if we, if the far as far as I understand it, if we want to come to a model where where we have a say a federated um, structure and we want to connect these different centers better. Um, I do, I, I, I do believe that, that, that we need to tackle these issues around um, use, uh, reuse, um, and, and a lot of different, I think, legal uh, clarity on, on the interpretation of a lot of legal concepts that are connected to, um, to, to, to GDPR on what does scientific exploitation now exactly mean in this context and all of these spaces. I really believe that we need that. Maybe we can work with all the brilliant lawyers that will be at work there. Maybe we can do it somehow without, but it will take longer. And I think for all the, the ones that we want to connect to this space to make it usable, I think it will be um, it, it, it will be so much harder if we don't pave the way with legislation. And again, um, this this should be the moment to to get the parties aligned because we understand it's a difficult and a tedious topic, but we all know that there is such an enormous opportunity. So I think we should go for it. And if it then benefits the European health data space or if something else comes out. Well, that's fine, but I think we need to we need to continue the journey, and we need to be serious about it. Okay, so legislation is an important part of it. Matteo, quick comment. Uh, I am, yes, uh, first comment about collaboration. Let me tell you that, as you know, in the uh, high performance computing uh, field, we have already working together in the praise at the praise level. So we have several centers that can be used for any European researchers. They can access to any data from many many applications. What we should propose is just to do the same, providing this center and other, other institutions with this data coming from the, from the hospital and allow uh, collaborative, collaborative research between them. Okay, They need this data, they have the tools, 
we have the tools, we are experiencing artificial intelligence. So we have a unique opportunity in Europe to go farther away to be pioneers in the future medicine. We have all the instruments to do that. Okay, oh, thank you, Matteo. Now, we, gentlemen, we've only got a couple of minutes left before we need to wrap. So I'm just going to ask each of you just to look five years into the future and just pick out one way in which AI could have changed healthcare in that time frame. So it can be a very specific example or it can be a much broader kind of example. If you can give me one example of what you think is realistic in a five year time frame, and obviously in a positive impact of AI on healthcare. Casper, if I can start with you on that. It's obvious to start with a political scientist when you're asking basically a, a medical uh, question. But but let me let me just re relay what uh, much smarter people than me have told me when I've been asking the same question um, in in technology companies. I, I think an area like cancer treatment is going to be revolutionized uh, thanks to to AI. I think both in terms of diagnosis, but also sort of precision medicine. Uh, I think we are we're standing in front of of a very dramatic uh, change in our capabilities of treating potentially, uh, you know, very, very serious uh, diseases over the next couple of years. Uh, you know, since you gave me the flaw, um, which is always a mistake, I just want to point out that I actually remain optimistic about Europe's ability to guard, uh, guide us in the right direction. I think when you look at the at the European data space, uh, health data space, or when you look at the European Commission's uh, AI paper, I think you have seen the ability of Europe to, you know, strike the right balance between looking at the fantastic opportunities that AI brings along and at the same time, making sure that we mitigate some of the some of the dramatic risks that are also associated with it. So I, I just wanted to, you know, I'm not optimistic by nature. I'm Danish, and you know, the weather is always terrible up there. So we are sort of chronically depressed. But I just want to get across that I, I remain optimistic that we can get this right if we have a, a collaborative effort in uh, in in working together and in defining the future. Okay. No, thank you, Casper. Uh, Jan Philip, I'll come to you, and then we'll we'll finish with Matteo. Uh, Jan Philip, your five year vision. Um, yes, sorry, I have some background noise here just at work at the moment. I will be very, very sharp. Um, um, Kasper has talked a lot about impact. Maybe one pro prognosis, I think within five years, not a single doctor really will be replaced by AI, but I don't think that there will be a single specialist not using it. Okay, all right, thank you. That's uh, food for thought. And Matteo, if we can finish with you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to predict five years because the AI is moving so fast that we get, nobody can predict, but the AI is already established in the future medicine, okay? In, in our supercomputing center, we are using many, many uh, tools in order to help to the doctor, okay? So I think that what we say about the, the twin, uh, digital twin for many, many diseases, the cancer or the virus is an important development and we have all the tools in Europe that, to go in this direction. So I am very, very positive in this way. Okay, we're finishing on a nice optimistic note there. So Thank you, gentlemen, for your time, and uh, thank you to the audience as well for uh, your questions and your attention uh, this afternoon. Um, I think you can watch a replay of this uh, conference on the Science Business website, so you can uh, you can replay this back. But thanks again, uh, gentlemen, for joining us today. It's been a good discussion. Thank you.